as we know, it's just it's kind of been a relentless uptrend, you know, strong and up to the right uh, since since 50,000 when the ETF was approved. And, um, you know, uh, there's another thing, probably a lot of people didn't focus on it, but I did. And it's a it's a big deal. Uh, there was a letter from the Industry Swaps and Dealers Association to the Federal Reserve saying, hey, you know what, we, we really think you ought to throw away this SLR, this, um, you know, this limit that you place on the banks and their ability to buy treasury debt. And of course, the reason for that is that there's a lot of treasury debt to be sold and the number of buyers are slowly but surely shrinking. And if you really read through the lines on that carefully, and it's a lot of inside baseball and, and you know, monetary plumbing. Lawrence Leppard, a sound money advocate, Bitcoin enthusiast and investment manager with Equity Management Associates, spent decades advising investors to avoid the constant debasement of fiat currencies by investing in gold. With Bitcoin's creation, Leopard's task has become easier because the leading cryptocurrency is the better alternative, a digital gold that offers adequate protection. This ultra-bullish prediction for Bitcoin is based on the constant fiat debasement and growing concerns that the situation will worsen in 2024. Leopard references Biden's recently announced $7.3 trillion budget proposal and ISA's letter to the Federal Reserve FDIC and Office of the Controller of the Controller of the Currency to urge them to implement targeted supplementary leverage ratio reforms. These are all solid evidence that America's debt will worsen, far more than the Congressional Budget Office expects, according to SLR Leopard. Leopard's Natalie interview clips are here. First, like this video, subscribe to the channel, and enable post alerts for more videos like this. Thanks, and enjoy the video. It's more or less kind of QE infinity, or it'll give the banks the ability to, to just unlimited in an unlimited way monetize the debt um, and put it on their balance sheet because it, you know they don't have to count it as a reserve. And so they can more or less print money to buy the government debt. So it hasn't been approved yet. It was a letter, uh, but it's clearly those kinds of things. They start with a letter and then they come with a Federal Reserve proclamation that this is what we're going to do. And they did it in 2020. And they did it in 2020 because at that point in time, they needed to do it because the debt, they were having a hard time selling the debt then as well. So so to me, that's a it's a, a big deal. Um, and I, I'm not sure the market's fully absorbed it, although, you know, you could also argue maybe the market has absorbed it because the two sound money assets, gold and Bitcoin, are both at record highs or mm -hmm. you know, very close to gold's backing off a bit today. But uh, gold had been constrained within a range of kind of a two thousand one hundred dollar top, you know, twenty fifty, twenty one hundred dollar top. And it, it broke through that rather decisively in the last couple of weeks. So, um, you know, I, I, I think I think the wider world is wake, awakening to the issues that many of us in this area have been talking about for some time. And that is that we have a sovereign debt problem and that uh, right. the likelihood is that the, the solution of the government will be to monetize it. And that goes to the letter I just referred to. So. So that's kind of the, the climate we're in. And, you know, um, I, I kind of see the sky as the limit for both of these assets. Uh, I expect they'll be higher in a month and I expect they'll be much higher in six months. So so the problem that I think the government is going to have as, as they continue to run these deficits and as they continue to go into, the, you know, the, so so let's keep it really simple. You know, 101, the government spends more than it takes in in tax revenue. We know that. And it's getting worse. Um, how do they finance that? They finance that by issuing a bond. Okay, the bond gets an interest rate price gets set on that bond, which is the, you know, a reflection of the supply and demand for those bonds. And if there is no demand, kind of by definition, that means the interest rate price has to get higher. And that higher interest rate price would then lead to more interest expense for the government, which um, it would kind of lead to what, you know, James Lavish has, has said so clearly is, is a debt spiral or a debt death doom loop. And so so the federal government and the Federal Reserve have a real incentive to try and keep interest rates under control. Um, that's that's a key piece of, of, you know, of what they have to do, because, you know, if we went to I mean, we're at, you know, on the 10 year now we're in the forest, but we were at five and, and we saw how that created a problem last fall. Mm -hmm. And so if we went to five, six, seven, eight on the 10 year and higher rates on the you know, or, or similar rates in the shorter durations, um, you know, the, the government interest expense would blow out even further. And, and it's already blown out. It's over a trillion dollars a year, up from much less than that three or four years ago. But um, and so it, it would accelerate the, the, the funding problem and the, and the financial problem that the government has. And so as a result of all of that, um, you know, the government and others are looking for ways to find more buyers of those bonds. And uh, because to the degree that they can find a buyer that, that you know, creates supply, 
or it creates demand, which you know would bring interest rates down, and that's what they want to have happen. They want to have interest rates come down um, so that their funding costs are lower. Um, the banks can buy these bonds, and often they do, and then they quickly flip them to the Fed or flip them to somebody else, or they can leave them on their balance sheet, but they're somewhat constrained in terms of what they can leave on their balance sheet because of what you referred to, the SLR, the supplementary leverage ratio. And, um, you know, it's it's... It's confusing, even to you know experts like me. It's somewhat confusing how this whole mechanism works, because it's it's kind of tricky monetary plumbing that nobody really pays attention to. But boy, when this when this is the letter came out, those of us who were in the know, you know, um, Fed guy uh, twelve, you know, Joseph Wang or, or Luke Roman or you know those of us who are watching the Lynn or those are watching the monetary plumbing very carefully, like holy shit, if I'm reading this correctly, this means that these banks can buy as many of these bonds as they want, no problem, and they can create the money to do it. And so yeah. it, that, you know, it's kind of broadly speaking, it, it kind of looks like QE infinity. Mm-hmm. Um, now, you know, because of the way it's it's sort of backdoor and subtle, you know, I mean, obviously the Fed right now, if they were to stop QT and announce QE, that would be seen as being massively inflationary. And that would not, you know, that would not be a good thing for them. That would help, would not help in their fight against inflation. But if they can get the banks to do their dirty work by changing the regulations that the banks are underneath, hey, that's great. They get to the same place. It's just not called QE. So I think that's kind of a, my synopsis of what's going on. On March 5th, the International Swaps and Derivatives Association, ISDA, submitted a letter to the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC, and the Office of the Controller of the Currency, the OCC, urging the agencies to implement targeted reforms. To the Supplementary Leverage Ratio SLR and Enhanced Supplementary Leverage Ratio SLR and Risk-Based Search Charge for Global Systemically Important Bank Holding Companies the GCIB Search Charge, according to AA's letter, these are important to preserve the resilience of the United States Treasury. Markets and the U.S. economy and financial system more broadly with the letter ISDA is looking to facilitate the participation by banks in the U.S. Treasury market by urging the agencies to revise the SLR to permanently exclude on balance sheet U.S. Treasuries from total leverage exposure consistent with. The scope of the temporary exclusion for U.S. Treasuries that the agencies implemented during the pandemic, while these words may seem harmless to an unsuspecting person, Leopard declares it to be an extremely ominous omen that trouble is on the horizon. Additional interview excerpts follow. When they're trapped, the the default condition is always print more money, you know, print or go burr. Um, But um, yeah, I mean, Biden is talking about trying to tax the rich, you know, the, the increase in the Total budget size is is enormous. I mean, I was reading something in the Wall Street Journal this morning talking about how the whole budget was really a fantasy because a lot of a lot of what he's projecting just isn't realistic. I mean, I find it amazing that the CBO is is projecting not that great an outcome for the next five or ten years, and they're saying there won't be any recessions in a ten year window, and they think that inflation and interest rates are going to go back to two or three percent. And you know, I'm, I'm like, what planet are these people living on? So, yeah, it's it's. Um, we live in a financial fantasy world, really, that, that these people have kind of constructed. Um, but, you know, there are some free markets. Probably Bitcoin is the freest of all the markets in terms of, you know, lack of manipulation. And guess what? You know, they, they get it. I mean, Bitcoiners get it. And people, people are getting it. And they're, they're, you know, they're saying, OK, if you're going to debase my currency, I'm going to buy a currency that by definition cannot be debased above and beyond the, you know, the programmatic uh, formula. So... Uh, and this is why Bitcoin, Bitcoin's at, all, at new all-time highs, and I expect it's going to go much higher. Yeah, and some gold guys are getting mad at me. I'm not. I'm not down on gold, I, I, and I never have been. Um, you know, I, I the I'm I'm pivoting or not pivoting. I'm trending away towards gold just because. Um, you know, and, and it, let me get let me make a couple things straight. I think gold is going to do incredibly well in the monetary debasement that's coming, but I think Bitcoin is going to do much better than that. <laughs> And so as an investment manager, my job is to earn the top risk adjusted return for my for my clients. And I view Bitcoin as as a better risk adjusted return than gold um, this far into the game. And now having a lot of the risks in my mind in Bitcoin gone away. I mean, perfect example. One of the biggest risks, I think, in Bitcoin until the ETFs, um, you know, was TradFi looked at it or, or most investment pools looked at it and said, how can we invest in Sailor made this point? How can we invest in something that we think the government might shut down? And, you know, when the government approved the ETFs, I mean, they more or less gave the green light. Say, well, we're not going to shut it down, at least not now. Um, There might come a time when, you know, they're in distress and they decide they want to shut it down. That's a whole different discussion. But that's a few years out. And so, um, you know, I think with the with the 
endorsement of the ETFs and the recognition that those funds are now going to flow into it, this is no longer just a niche form of sound money. This is mainstream sound money. And it can really, in a, in a meaningful way, compete with gold. And so as a result of that, uh, and I think it will beat gold over time, um, but that doesn't mean nominally, I don't think gold will ever go down. I mean, gold in fiat terms will continue to go up, just not as quickly as Bitcoin. And so one of the things that happens, I mean, there was a time probably six months ago where I was personally 50-50 gold and gold related things, things in my fund that are gold stocks and so forth and, and Bitcoin. And um, that's probably now, I haven't done the math recently, but it's probably like 60, 40 or 65, 35, partly just because the Bitcoin went up, you know, yeah. I, mean, I didn't, I didn't buy any more Bitcoin. I didn't buy any more gold. Actually, I actually did buy some more Bitcoin, but not a lot. Um, but, you know, when the price of Bitcoin goes up as a percentage of your asset holdings, it be becomes a larger percentage. So, you know, I, I've not completely abandoned gold. And I think gold is very appropriate for people who want a sound money alternative with lower volatility. With almost $200 trillion in funded and unfunded debt, a debt-to-GDP ratio of over 120%, and interest rates that are rising quickly, it is clear that the U.S. is on a fiscal path that can't be sustained. This is exactly what the U.S. Department of Treasury said in the executive summary to the fiscal year 2022 financial report. Macro analysts and well-known investors in both traditional and alternative investments, such as Bitcoin and gold, have been warning about the coming debt storms for years. Two. Because interest rates were kept artificially low for so long, it was easy for policymakers to downplay the problem and make it look like everything was fine. That's no longer possible. The cracks are not only showing, they're almost tripling over themselves. The most recent example is Chairman Jerome Powell's statement that the U.S. is on an unsustainable path and that the only way forward is for decision makers to have serious conversations about the way forward. What did you think of Leopard's interview? Please leave your thoughts and comments below and don't forget to give this video a thumbs up. If you want to see more movies like this, please subscribe to the channel and turn on post notifications.